We've been going through the uh, David, if you remember, and we've been there quite a while. And I think it's important. We're getting close to the end of his life. And I think during uh, kind of bringing you a little bit of a background, kind of what we're talking about today, it was in 2002, I had just been to the refinery just a month or so, and I got called up for jury duty. And since I wasn't an official employee yet, you know, I, they didn't pay me. Well, I happened to be on a uh, jury that, or the federal building, some of you might have remembered this, the federal building was broken into downtown, and uh, subsequent uh, office was broken into, and then a fire was started. And all I had was circumstantial evidence to, to uh, deal with this young man. So I was on the jury, and it was quite obvious that uh, he was guilty with what was going on, fingerprints and so on. But I was on there with some different jurors, and so while I was on there, it was kind of interesting. On one of them, an elderly uh, gentleman, I say elderly, he probably was close to my age, but you know, that's 20 years ago. <laughs> 20 years ago. I'll never forget his statement, <clears throat> because the state and the police could have done a little bit better job than what they had done with some of the evidence. And he said, we need to teach the state a lesson. We need to let the man walk. I'm thinking... Out here, I thought I had, a, you know, we had some young ones on there. And I thought, well, you have an elderly man. This guy's going to have some wisdom, and he's going to impart wisdom to them. I thought, boy, that's sad. You don't, you know, you let somebody go that's guilty just to teach the state a lesson. It reminds me of Job 32. Remember in Job's friends, it's interesting what it says here in verse 9, 32, 9. The abundance in years may not be wise. They may not be wise. So no, just because a person gets older doesn't mean they're wise even though oftentimes we see that. Nor may elders understand justice. Just because they're elders and they're sitting to judge doesn't mean they're giving out justice. We can also see that in our court systems. So think about it. We listen to it how many times just because we're getting older doesn't mean we're using wisdom. A lot of it has to do with, if you want to title for the message, be careful who you listen to. Careful who you listen to, because it's so important who we listen to makes all the differences, the directions, and what we come up with. Um, you see that a lot. You think about that, and you look at this towards the end of David's life, and he listens to the wrong people, and he makes some poor decisions that affects a lot of people. Any of you ever listened to the wrong things and came to the wrong conclusions? How well is it when you have to eat humble pie afterward? Because you came to the wrong conclusion. So let's look at it. We're going to give you, uh, it's going to be in 2 Samuel 24 and then in 1 Chronicles 21. You need both of them because we're going to flip flap uh, back and forth between them because of the uh, what happens. Part of the story is found in one and part of the story is found in the other. So you look at it. And while you're going, let me just give you a, a little uh, introduction. The dangers of our associations, who we associate with. I'll give you some passages when you stop and think about it. I'll quote our Paraphrasing. Remember in 2 Timothy 2.22, he tells Timothy, Timothy's roughly 40, and he says, Flee youthful lusts and pursue love, righteousness, peace with those who are love God from a pure heart. So you think about it. Our, we choose our path. He says to pursue it. So it's going to be an effort on our part, and it's with the right people. Big, big difference. We, have, we make the choices. You go to Proverbs 22, 24, and 25. Remember, it says, uh, be careful who you associate with. If you associate with a man giving to anger, you're going to become a snare to you, and you're going to be like what? Like him. You're going to be one who's going to be hot-tempered. In 1 Corinthians 30, 15, 33, remember, it says, bad, don't be deceived. A bad company does what? So in other words, a Christian can be deceived. And he can be associated with the wrong group and come up with the wrong ideas and conclusions. So again, we have uh, we can be blind and we can be uh, behavior can be bad. In Galatians two, which was written roughly fifteen to twenty years after Christ was taken, Peter being one of the pillars, you remember Paul had to rebuke him publicly because it said that Peter was associating with the Gentiles and everything else until a group from Jerusalem came down and he became aloof and wouldn't associate with them. And then it said, and even Barnabas was carried away, one of the first disciples to the Gentiles. So I think, how many times do we change based upon who we're with? We're with this group, we're over here, and then we're over here, we can become like it. 
And so those are all choices, but we have to realize just how important our influences can be in our life. And so you have that. Uh, how many times do you ever get together with family uh, get-togethers and some of the behaviors that you thought everybody had forgot about come back out when the family is together from 20 years or 30 years earlier? Some of those things don't change. They should, but they don't. You know, the same thing in Matthew 16. You remember when Jesus is saying he's going to go to the cross, and it says Peter takes him aside to tell him, no, you don't go to the cross. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, what? Because your interests are man's interests and not God's interests. It's an interesting statement. How many times are we looking at God's interests, and how many times are we looking at our own? See, and I think it's important. So here we have who we associate with has such an important aspect in our lives. So let's look at it. We're going to start with 2 Samuel 24, and then we'll go over to 1 Chronicles. Just the first part of 2 Samuel 24, in verse 1. It says, Now again the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. Now, so if God is upset with Israel, does he say why? It doesn't say why. You notice it said, and then David... And it, it, call it the Israel, it incited David against them. So God is upset with Israel, and David then gets upset. Now we're not told exactly what it is. We read between the lines when you look at it, what it happens. You remember, they just got to have a number of military successes. They've really grown in their nation. They've defeated most of the enemy. And it appears then that they're starting to take some credit for all their victories themselves. Remember, did they not, in the previous chapter, did they not just destroy all the different giants that came up before? How many times do we ever take some credit when God helps us and we kind of take the credit? Hey, perhaps they're wanting to enlarge their territory, which God did not tell them to do so. And they're now, hey, how many people do we have? How many are in our army? How big are we? Can we do it? Rely on ourselves and what they want to do. So you think about it, here they have in the background, then God's upset with Israel. And David decides to do something. Now go over in Second in, in First uh, Chronicles twenty one now, and let's see what he decides to do. God's upset with Israel. <clears throat> Notice what he does in verse one. First Chronicles twenty one one. Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Who put the thought in David's mind to number Israel? Satan did. Isn't David supposed to be a man after God's own heart? Isn't this at the end of David's life when he has walked with the Lord and had ups and downs? And shouldn't he know better? You know, you stop and think about it. How many times do we ever stop in our own life and realize that Satan can do that with you and I as well? So you look at it, here he has. So the question I ask, who did David listen to? He sees the people, and God's upset with them, and David chooses to do what? When you number the people, there's only two reasons for numbering the people in the Old Testament. You number them for taxation, and you number it for military draft. How many people do you have in the army? David is not doing it for either reason here. Stop and think about it. Who David doesn't listen to? Notice then what happens, you go down in verse 2, and we'll stay in 1 Chronicles since you're there. So David said to Joab and to the princes of the people, Go and number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring me the word that I may know their number. So in other words, go throughout the whole land. Give it two extremes. So it would be like saying go from Minnesota to Texas, from California to New York. Go all over number. Notice then Joab sees through this, and notice what he says. Joab said, May the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as there are. But my Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why does my Lord seek this thing? Why should he cause a guilt to Israel? Hey, don't be relying on numbers. Don't be looking at people. I'm going to be relying on God. I want you to increase, but this is dumb. Just don't do it. Well, you know, that takes something for Joab to go tell the king not to do something. How many times are people telling us advice that we don't listen to? Notice what he does. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and went throughout all of Israel 
and came to Jerusalem. Okay? Did, did he listen to Joy? Did he pray about it? Did he seek Nathan or Gad or any of the other spiritual leaders that were in his disposal? No. He simply cited by the people. Satan puts a thought in his head. And what does he do? He follows it. And when people are kind of telling him differently, he doesn't listen. And it's going to cause a lot of trouble. <coughs> But I'm going to think about it, just some applications. Do I see Satan as one who can influence my thoughts? Have you ever stopped to think about it? <clears throat> Was it also personal pride? Yes. Look at what I have, look at this. How many times does pride get us in trouble? You don't need a show of hands, but how many times when you're in a car and you miss uh, a turn... Do you uh, turn around or do you say, I'm just taking the scenic route? <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Personal pride, it's amazing how it will affect all of us. What happens if you're the one who knows the stuff and some novice comes and tells you or shows you what you're doing wrong? And do we recognize it and say, hey, you're right. Thanks. Pride is amazing. But notice, is David accountable to anybody? David is the king and he is not accountable. He wasn't accountable as he should have been to his leadership. What happens, I think, so often in spiritual, uh, especially when somebody becomes uh, pretty big at where they're at, the accountability so often falls by the wayside. You look at so many ones. One thing I liked about Billy Graham, he had open books from the very inception. And do you realize he got a salary? It didn't matter if $500 million came in. It didn't change the amount of money that he received. They decided his salary. That's what he got made, no matter how much accountability. David was not being accountable. But again, we say, well, we need to be accountable. Then how many of us are accountable to somebody? How many of you are accountable to somebody? What happens is we don't like it because what happens when we mess up? How would you do this week? Well, I screwed up. So we don't want to have to say that, so we want everybody to think what? That everything's going fine. So we don't want to be accountable. David didn't want to be accountable, and consequently it got him in trouble. Think about it. How well do you listen to counsel? Did Joab give him good counsel? Did he listen to it? Why? It's amazing how many times we don't. There's it's out there, but we don't. There's a lot of different voices, so we have to remember, we have to search through the voices to see. So the first one you think about, there's the dangers of our association. David listens to the wrong one. So let's look at it and see now what's going to take place. And uh, you don't have to turn over to it, but in 2 Samuel 24, it says it takes him nine months and 20 days to do this. So in other words, almost 10 months it took for them to go throughout all of Israel and to number all the people. So that took him you know, quite, quite some time. So when you look at it in this story then, you pick it up on it, notice in verse 7, what happened of First Chronicles 21. God was displeased with this thing, so he struck Israel. Okay, it doesn't tell you how, it doesn't tell you what. Some type of, you know, was it famine, was it disease, we're not told what it was, but he does. So after nine months and 20 days, you see what takes place, and you see it in Chronicles 2, I mean, uh, in Samuel, rather, it says in verse 10, I'll just read it, and if you're there, you can switch back and forth. But in 2 Samuel 24 and verse 10, now David's heart has troubled him after he numbered the people. Inside of David's heart, he recognizes what? What I'm doing, this isn't right. It's really, really troubled in his heart. The man after God's own remember, he did it. He's told not to, but he does it. And that, that going on this 10 months, it's just eating away at it. You know, I shouldn't have been doing this. This was wrong. Now all of a sudden he looks up and he sees it's causing Israel problems. And the people are suffering because of his decision. Now you think about it, when Saul did that, what did he say? The people made me do it. 
So what happens when we make decisions and there are bad consequences? Do we take responsibility? Granted, they were the ones who were pushing David, but David still was the one who chose to do it. He didn't listen to Joab, listen to the people. So then notice what David does, and you think about it, you can find it in either one. If you're in First Chronicles, they're almost identical, but in verse 8 it said, David said to God, I have sinned greatly, and then I have done this thing. And now please take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolish. Does he take full responsibility? When he finally comes to real recognition and realization, he says, hey, I screwed up. How refreshing is it when somebody does that, takes full responsibility, doesn't blame it on anybody, and said, hey, I'm wrong for what I did. So I think it's interesting that you have the people are suffering, David is suffering inside, and he God takes responsibility to do it. Uh, how do I view my own personal sin when I come face to face with it? How many times have you ever heard this statement? That's just the way I am. In other words, what? I'm justified to do what I did. Uh, do I accept full responsibility or am I like Saul and I kind of say, well, we put it off on other people? David takes full responsibility. Ultimately, the buck stops with him and he blew it. So it's interesting. So he recognizes it. Now, it's one of the few times, in fact, I think it's the only time in Scripture God gives options. God is now going to confront David, and he's going to give him three options to choose what penalty he wants. But how would you like it if you messed up, as we all do, and God gets a hold of you and says, all right, Lynn, you got three options. Option A, you have door number one, door number two, or door number three. Yeah. <laughs> now I want you to look at it and you think about it. Put yourself in David's place. What option would you choose and why would you choose it? You blew it. The people are suffering. You listen to Satan. You, know, you listen to the people. You accept the responsibility, but now there's consequences. So let's look at these options and how would you like to be the guy that has to go tell it? So notice you have it since you're in First Chronicles, starting in verse 9. Notice that the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, So he tells his seer to go talk to David. How well did Joab listen to David? So how would you like to be Gad? Now you're going to have to go talk to him. So notice what he says. Go and speak to David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose yourself one of them, that I may do it to you. you got three options of punishment. Here they are. So, notice what it is. Verse 12. Either three years of famine. Okay, three years of famine is going to affect how many people? Everybody. Animals, obviously, a lot. Three months be swept away by your foes. So, you remember, you've all been fighting the Philistines and the Ammonites and all the rest. But now I'm going to give you three months and they're going to be able to come over your land and I'm going to allow them to have victories everywhere they go. While the sword of your enemies overtake you, or else three days of the Lord, a sword of the Lord, even pestilence in the land. The angel of the Lord destroys throughout all of Israel. Now therefore, consider what I answer, shall I return to him who sent me? So your options are three years of famine, three months of the enemies coming in and wiping you out and having the full reign of your nation, and winning all the battles. Three days when there's pestilence and this angel sword comes on your leg. What would you choose and why would you choose it? If you think about it, how much notice did you have? The angel's sitting there, right? Ready to take the answer back? David makes a very wise choice. And let's see if you agree with his choice. Notice then what he says in 13. He has a choice. Notice the, his choice in 13. David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall in the hands of the Lord. In other words, three days. For his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall in the hands of man. God is more merciful than man. If you think about it, isn't that, if you want to give an example, what about with Jonah? Why did Jonah get so upset with God in Jonah chapter 3 and chapter 4, you remember God said he's going to destroy Nineveh. 
unless they repented. And Jonah didn't want it because he said you are a merciful God and if they repent, you're not going to destroy them and I want them destroyed. And that was a prophet of God. How many of us have enemies that we want destroyed? And it doesn't matter if they say, hey, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. We still want what? We want them gone. So notice then he asked for three days. Now, again, how would you feel if you're David? I didn't listen to Joab. I didn't pray about my decision. And now we have tremendous consequences. By the way, are there not consequences to every one of us when we make decisions? <coughs> Some are just a lot, whole lot more obvious. How would you like if every one of us knew about all your decisions and the consequences? Do you think maybe we would have a new uh, soap opera, opera going on? And I think we all would have a part that we really would rather not, right? So that's what happens then. So here are the consequences. You notice in verse 14, So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel and 70,000 men of Israel fell. That's why you notice they were numbering the men for what reason? Their army, and remember they wanted this, and look, they were looking to their army and what they had and their protection, and God's saying, hey, and Joab recognized their protection is where? It's not in the men, it's in God. Think about it, because of the decision he made, the, how many people suffered? But it's even more when you think about it, when you look at it, it goes on in here since you're in Chronicles, starting in 15. Notice what happens. God sent an angel of Jerusalem to destroy it, but as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw and was sorry over the calamity, and he said to destroy the angel, It is enough. Relax your hand, and the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing hole of the floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Now we're going to find out why he stopped. I think it's interesting why. Look at it. David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel standing between the earth and heaven with a drawn sword. So remember, God allowed him to see. We've seen this in, throughout. At times, God can allow us to see things. He saw it. Now, how would you feel right about now if you looked up and uh, there was an angel of the Lord, which, by the way, that happened did it not in uh, Egypt, when the angel of the Lord goes out throughout the land. He sees that up, and he sees it over all the people in Jerusalem, and you see the angel there. And notice what David does then. Standing there, and it says, David and the elders, covered with sackcloth, fell on their faces. Why did the elders do that? Remember, I said it was the people. It wasn't, David had the final say so. But notice the people were pushing, and the elders, and as leaders, the elders recognized we messed up too. So notice they're falling and asking for God's mercy when God sees the, the, the mercy and the, what they're begging for, not that they deserve it. He stops the end. And they don't get as much. What do you think would have happened if that would have been the Philistines or the Amorites? Do you think they would have been merciful? No. So that's why he was wise to fall on the mercy of God. It's true for all of us. How many of us do we really get what we deserve? If we really got what we deserve, it would be hell, would it not? Because all of us have messed up. And you think about it, if I just didn't get hell, that would be not mercy. But how would we say I'm going to get heaven by the grace of God? I certainly don't deserve that. We have a very merciful God. So look at it then when he does. <clears throat> David said in verse 17 to God, Is it not I who commanded to count the people. Indeed, I am the one who has sinned and that very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? O Lord my God, please let thy hand be against me and my father's house, but not against thy people, that they should be plagued. The people were involved, but David had ultimate. He said, hey, put it all on me and my family. Don't. Again, that's a true shepherd. Saul wanted to put the blame on everybody else. David wants to accept it. So you think about it. If you're in David's place, what option would you have chosen? And why would you have chosen? David made the wise choice. But how many times do you and I fall on God's grace? Notice then he's not ordered to do something. It's interesting when you look at what he's ordered to do, starting in 18. The angel of the Lord commanded 
Gad to say to David that David should go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. That's where it stopped. The reason this is important, this is later going to become the site of the temple, and he buys the whole plot. Okay, so this is the very place where it's going to be built. But notice then what he does. But think about it, here Ornan, and here comes your king. And it says here that Ornan saw the angels and it scared his four sons and they run and hide, which I'm sure if I saw an angel, I'd do the same thing. Uh, so notice here comes David, and he says to Ornan that he wants his land. Now Ornan comes and he bows himself, prostrates himself before the king. Who's the one that's causing the problems? David was ultimately. But notice he sees his king as the leader and he's bowing down. And obviously, how humbling is that going to be if you're the king? You're there and all these problems are happening. And here's this guy who's bowing himself to you. And you think the angel's right there and there's this man's four sons. Think about the place you're in. So notice what he asks. And Ornan, I think it's amazing. David says, give me the side of it, verse 22. Give me the side of this threshing floor that I may build on it an altar to the Lord for the full price you should give it to me, that the plague may be restrained from the people. And Ornan said to David, Take it for yourself. Let my lord the king do what is good in his sight. See, I'll give you the oxen for the burnt offerings and threshing sledges for wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I'll give it all to you. Well, that's an amazing offer he's given to him. All the problems are happening because of Who? And hey, I'll give you the land, I'll give you the offering, I'll give you the wood, and I'll give you the grain, and you can have it all. But what does David say? And I think it's a good lesson for all of us. Notice what David says in 24. The king said to him, No, I will surely buy for full price, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord, for an offer, burnt offering which costs me nothing. Now, how many times do you and I give out of our surplus? And how many of us give out of sacrifice that someone's going to cost us something? I think most of the time we give out out of surplus. It doesn't cost us something. It's one of the reasons why I think it's so easy. The older we get, we will give money. Because that's easy. But we won't give up our time and other things. Because that's going to cost us something. But we can, you know, we can throw a $20 bill in and say, that's okay. I got extra twenty, no problem. Notice David paid full price. The rest, that way, he gave it to the Lord, and it cost him something. It's interesting what happens when he builds the altar. Then notice when he offers the sacrifices in twenty-six. It's interesting. Notice in verse twenty-seven, the Lord commanded the angel, and he's put his sword back in the sheath. He buys the land, he makes the offering, and then it stops. So you think about it. What am I offering to the Lord and does it cost me anything? You ever think about what he... Uh, when you stop and you think about it, did it cost the Lord anything to buy us? But does he require it of us or does he want us to willingly give it? You've been bought with a price, therefore what? Glorify God in your body? That's our choice. Romans 12, 1 and 2? No. Seat you therefore, uh, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies what? Living, holy, acceptable sacrifice. Now, the difference in the Old Testament, it had to be a pure, holy sacrifice. But how many of them are willing? That's a big difference. They didn't walk out in there and say, hey, all of you that are without blemish, which one of you wants to be sacrificed today? The little lamb comes around and says, me, me, me. Right? But isn't that what he's asking you and I to do? He says, take it to the cross off David. So you think about it with David. He, he learned the consequence. But again, how many of us would want that recorded about us for all the rest of the world to see from now on? Think about it. Let's think of the applications then. Am I careful of who and what I listen to, knowing it could be of the end. You know, I gave you that illustration a while back when my brother Bill was telling me when he was a youth uh, director in uh, Decatur, Alabama, when he had a person who wanted to go to Bible college and his parents said no, 
because you can't make a living, and I want you to follow in my footsteps to what engineer whatever it happened to be. Nothing wrong with an engineer or anything else, but the Lord's calling us someone to do something. It's best not to stand in their way. What about the other one? How do I view my sin when I come face to face with it? Hey, I'm not as bad as Dan. You know, what he did was a whole lot worse than what I'm doing. It, and that's what we do, isn't it? You know, we take, it's like paint. How many of you ever you know, looked at white paint and you think it's white until you do what? Then you put it up next to one. I'll never forget, this really happened to me 45 years ago. I was in uh, Mountain Brook, Alabama. Mountain Brook at that time was the wealthiest city in the United States, per capita. And I had a customer that was there. I carried her, her daughter was paralyzed, and so I carried her to beauty parlor and stuff like that. She wanted her house painted. I said, okay. She had a house painting the outside. She said, oh, uh, it hadn't been done in 15 years. A white shingled house on the outside. She said, I just want you to take the white and dab where it's peeled. <laughs> hey, it's the same white as what I used before. Yes, but what has sunlight done to it? said, no, I'll either paint the whole thing or I don't want any part. Because I mean, that's going to look terrible. That's going to look terrible. But she only wanted one side painted. You know? So I painted the one side. But it's just amazing. How many times do you and I, we're usually we're put up against? And it happens all the time in your house. You start painting one room, or start painting one door, and what happens? You didn't realize just how dingy the place is. The whole place gets in. Think of another one. What about this one? You think about it. If I was in David's place, what option would I choose in life? What option would you choose? Would you rather fall into the hands of a merciful but angry God? Or would you rather fall in the hands of men? Am I willing to offer the Lord something that costs me something? David was willing. He was obedient. Notice immediately he did it. You know, he wanted to pay the full price. No special favors, just because I'm king. Because I'm king. Because I'm king. Because I'm king.